Hey everyone, this is Zan returning to our late age Agartha multiplayer game on turn 14. And we start the turn in probably one of the best things you'll see in the late age, which is actually finding two sites in a province. And not only that, but they're both death gem sites, which this nation really needs a lot of. Moving over to the rest, we have a bunch of raids into Tianqi, but unfortunately he predicted these. And while they technically low effort on my part, since these cave knights that got us through expansion are very expensive, this actually ends up being pretty bad for us. So we do lose a lot of gold on the initial fight. And that's unfortunate, because both braids failed. This one fails, and I think this is another one. They both fail pretty miserably. And that sucks. He brought a lot of these barbarian heavy horse to reinforce the provinces. We also pinged the throne, which is pretty cool. We just kind of confirmed that you know, it's got a bundle of heavy cavalry, heavy infantry, and a bunch of trolls. And this is all nothing that a bunch of flaming arrow crossbows can't handle. Mage-wise, they just have this Scythe Brender, which is an otherwise fantastic mage. Wish you could recruit these. And a Troll Shaman, which is, this is the one that you can summon, but their pets are random, and so it's unreliable. But they're pretty good mages. Ultimately, though, at best, what this might do is some Skelly Spam. And the Skelly Spam won't be able to do too much damage to our units. And also kind of dies to the same thing the trolls die to, which is flaming arrow crossbows. So yeah, this is going to be an easy throne to take. No biggie here. Uh, the only other thing I want to point out in the turn, just for your random reference, oh, is these Pale One Commanders. If you ever get them as a recruitable option, I think they're pretty good. Their negative is that they're slow, but sometimes you're playing a nation like Lady Jagartha that is also slow. And then you're just left with bonuses. They're cheaper than an indie commander. They're much more durable in every single way. They don't eat food. They're amphibious. And they have a siege bonus. That's all good. Yeah, I know. They're cold-blooded. But how often are your commanders, your basic commanders, fighting anyways? So whenever you get a chance, I always like recruiting these. They're really good. They're probably my second favorite to the like leather-armored mounted commander. Military-wise, we're just kind of focusing in on the gentle planes. And I don't see anything in Resena or the Red Mine, so I don't expect an attack on the Misty Forest, although the PD is pretty high. So yeah, for now, we're just going to chill out in these gentle, gentle Plains, and we're going to expect Zim Zimria over here to get taken. But that's okay. With that, we can move on to turn 15. And as expected, Zimria gets taken. And nothing else really happens this turn. Our lone site searcher was just moving. I think I really want a lot of early gems, so I really I really wish I could send more of these guys out site searching, and maybe I should have sent this guy site searching instead of profiting him. Just to kind of double the rate at which I get through everything and you know get these death gem sites early. Uh, and the earth gem ones too. But for the most part, we're we're just building up our infrastructure, kind of getting ready. There's one, there's this one little indie here in Lomark, but I think, again, that my diplomacy with man means that he's going to be able to, uh, to take that. He's not going to be contested by me, as long as I get the red mines. And yeah, it looks like TNG's kind of mobilized everything, and now we do actually have to defend the Misty Forest. So if you notice, I bumped up the PD here to 40, which is a significant investment, but honestly, my castles are kind of recruitment capped. Like, I'm doing what I can with my resources and recruitment points to just build, or I guess recruit, the heaviest infantry I can, both to absorb the last charges and to deal with potential ranged combat duels. So, yeah, and then here I'm starting to recruit these alchemists because I want to do flaming arrows to obviously take out the trolls here, but also flaming arrows would do good against TNC's forces, which tend to be or tend not to be sacred, and thus not fire resistant. Pretty short turn. Yeah, I think 15, 16 are kind of the same thing. Nothing happens. Oh, well. I mean, this is important. <laughs> uh, this copper arm is actually cool. I end up sending this copper arm to Lemuria, who is being an absolute menace somewhere else in the world. But uh, yeah, that was a pretty fortunate event there, giving me more cash. Start recruiting more alchemists. They're going to need a site search, too. Uh, I don't find anything here in Pavonia. You know, we are reminded sometimes that this is the late age. But so far, for what I've searched, this is a good spread of, or of sites. I I'm not too concerned. 
Anyways, let's go on now to 17, which is missing. That's unfortunate. But I don't think anything happened in 17 either. This has been a very slow war. And speaking of slow, we actually do find multiple sites, which is good. Uh, we find an ancient temple, which is... This is why I always tell people that you should site search with Holy Ones at the minimum. Uh, they tend to be very cheap, and you can occasionally find ancient temples for some S-gems. If you do it with higher level Holy Path, like Holy 3, there's a chance that you find sites that give you... Almost kind of like Eyes of God. You can see the graphs. They're not. It's not always you see all graphs, but... They, there tend to be very good sites at Holy 3, or Holy 2, even. But at the, at the minimum, I always say do Holy 1, because the priests, like even an indie priest can do it, and they tend to be cheap, and it gives you an Astral Pearl. If you're underwater, it's an Astral Pearl and a Water Gem, so more so you should do that. Uh, the other thing of note here is you see me summon Ancestors and Penumbrals. I think I do this mostly in the capital, right? Yeah. So Ancestors are these guys. They're kind of like really, really cheap thugs because they have natural protection 19, but then they don't have any body armor. So if you do slap some body armor on them, they're going to have really good protection. They're going to be very tanky. You can use these to mosh pit, I guess, the enemy as they kind of focus on killing this guy while your crosswomen just fire away willy-nilly. It's, it's actually a pretty cool combination. I think they cost you like three earth gems each, and yeah, sometimes they come with afflictions, but, you know, whatever. Their job is to just sit there and get hit and hopefully not die. They're naturally poison and cold resistant, which is good. And technically they're amphibians. They're crappy amphibians, so they can go underwater, but that tends to be difficult, as it always is. But right now, I'm just using them to lead these penumbrals. Now, penumbrals are an umbral's shitty cousin, but you get them earlier, and in this case for me, that's kind of important. I'm just bringing these as insurance, I guess. They have a, they have an armor-piercing magic attack, which the rest of my army does not have. So this is just kind of a just in case something happens or TNT does something that I, I don't really predict, say some body ethereal or brings out like a titan or a monster that I can't deal with with my regular short swords and crossbows. So that's all this is. Just some extra forces to reinforce. We're not having any luck with fire two alchemists, which, you know, it sucks, but sometimes it'd be that way. Anyways, since nothing has really been happening on the TNG front, uh, I made my defensive line, and I guess he got frustrated and left because I don't see his armies. I'm going to move into Resena, which I hope he put like a big PD dump I can just crush. And I'm also going to send another force to the Red Mines to take that. And I think that'll be turn 18. I don't think there's anything important here. Yeah. That's all I got written for 18. So we'll move on to turn 19. And turn 19 is nice and short. We get three death gems from Lemuria. I think... I, I didn't sell the copper arm for three death gems. I, I think it was the like a multi-turn deal. He's going to send me more gems as we go. And we find another two magic sites in Shem. We find a broken tower and a cavern tomb. So our site search luck has been through the roof. Let me double check. Is this... There's the game settings. Okay, so we're on magic... We're on middle age magic site frequency, not late age. So maybe that's explaining why I'm so fortunate. Still, I'm going to take it and be happy. I'll write eight, eight death gems a month on turn 19. That's pretty good. So we have a battle here in the Red Mines. I've been asked to show my battles, even if I think they're easy. Uh, yeah, this is one or two PD. Yeah, no shot. I'm doing this, by the way. I'm trying to keep my cave knights. I mean, it's not like they're going to run forward from the entrance guard. But I want them to slow them down, because I want the battle to take place closer to my ranged camp than theirs, just to kind of improve the precision of these crosswomen. That's the like ideal thing I'm trying to do. We have another battle here now in Resena. This is where we were hoping to fight their PD dub. We have these immortal possessed corpse that explode on death, and they're immortal, so I really don't care, and they're shitty... They're kind of shitty mages. They don't have the 19 protection that the other guy has. So their job is just kind of run forward and do that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good job, guys. Okay, but now here, this is the important one of this turn. This is pretty cool, and I'm actually going to stay talking about this for a while. We have the army of Pangea, including their White Bull Pretender, 
with a hard skin bless and enough magic pass to do personal regeneration. And you could probably put a ring on him too. And look at this, he's got both these resistance items on him. His nature path already gives him poison resistance. He's not cold resistance, but that's okay. Nature, if we remember, can also do elemental fortitude that gives you plus five across the board. Look at these experience stars. Five experience is good because it reduces your encumbrance. Technically it gives you strength too, but this is the important one. That's a, that's a huge increase. So this guy's got a lot of hit points here, which is surprising given he's attacking TNG. But this is a lot of Grove Guard supported with these Centaur Sages. And this is absolutely insane this early. Like this amount of troops is absolutely nuts. I don't know what these chicks are doing. They're casting protection, not on themselves. They're casting it on the Grove Guard, which I think would go to like, what, 23 protection? One buffed, it would be difficult to. Here, here, here. Let's see. Yeah, 23 protection. Damn, I'm good. <laughs> but this is absolutely a nutty army, and it's getting supported by body, ethereal, and protection all at once. This would kick my ass. If I put all of my armies on one province, and this showed up to fight it, I would lose. 100%. The army that I have is not prepared to deal with this nonsense. There is a way I could deal with it, and I'll get into that in a second, but I do need to show my unit screen for it. But this is beautiful. This is beautiful. This is one of the reasons I want to play Lady Japan so much. I actually had a game I started at Lady Japan, but I realized the server I was on and the people I was playing with, with meant that the game was going to have extensions every day, and it was really bad, and there was some weird mod on that I didn't really realize and at some point they, were, they they had to actually do a restart of the game so I took that as my chance to bounce which sucks but you know one day I'll play Lady Japan it'll be pretty cool but yeah 142 Grove Guard a Pretender and 11 Sages insane this early that's 7,000 gold in Grove Guard alone this is a nutty army absolutely nutty army this early they will fuck you up he, the, the thing with Grove Guard is you don't actually want that to be size 3 or above. You want them to trample you. Because in a lot of cases, trample is going to do less damage than their battle axe. It's a weird scenario where if they're swinging their axe, they're probably going to kill one unit every turn. Because I think, what, they berserk 3. So this will go to, what, 34 swing damage at 14 attack. And 34 swing damage, or slashing damage... At that point, even if you block it with your shield, your shield is probably going to break. <laughs> and they'll probably even hurt you through the shield, depending on what unit you are. So these guys are absolutely insane. And it just, it, I guess it depends on what nation you are, whether you want them to trample you or not. But I, I think as Agartha specifically, this is a very difficult matchup because your best national feature, which is your armor, is kind of negated by how hard these guys hit. And then they also trample you if you're smaller than them. So it can be tough to fight these guys. If I had to, and again, we're, we're acknowledging right now that if I ran into that army, it would cut right through these cave drakes. This guy was just be, you know, peanut butter in the face of him. The, all the armor that these guys have doesn't matter because they're being trampled. And that when you get trampled, it's an untyped damage, so if you have like slash resistance or something, it doesn't it doesn't count. And it's half your armor value. I don't think that the, the Militars trample too hard. I don't remember the formula right now. Let me actually pause it real quick so I can get Okay, so the trample formula is five times or five plus two times the size of the trampler. So this guy being size three means it's uh, five plus six is eleven. So it's going to be 11 armor piercing damage per trample. Which means these guys with their 21 defense skill essentially are just getting trampled every time for you know the dice roll. It'll match. Which is probably better than getting slashed for 34 damage per swing, which will probably break the kite shield. I mean with the kite shield they actually go to 40 protection, which is kind of cool, but it's very, very possible that it'll just break the shield itself, and on the next swing they're dead. 
So I'm not sure. I, I haven't tested this, and I'm going on pure theory, so I could probably be very wrong, and you guys please correct me and give me your input. But this is pure theory, that if I were to have to fight this horde of Groveguard, I probably would have a small line of sacrificial either infantry or cave knights, and then mostly just have these Agarth and Light infantry, but more and more, more much more importantly, the Agarth and Light crossbowmen. Uh, this is just a huge mass of these, especially with flaming arrows. I think this is the ticket to killing them, as well as these penumbrals. Because the penumbrals won't be trampled, and they have a 1 in 4 chance of avoiding the hit due to their ethereal. Now, if they do get hit, if I don't give them any sort of buff of protection, they're just going to die in one shot. Potentially two shots if they avoid the first hit and then life drain to get above some hit points but honestly i think umbrals <laughs> would probably be the best way to kill them if you like mix them in between your hordes of light infantry and archers with flaming arrows but right now because my entire army is heavy we have a significantly less crosswomen than we would otherwise have i should have like if i if i only had light crosswomen i would have maybe another 200 crossbows and at that point yeah the grove guard might be mincemeat just to how many crossbowmen would be firing at them. Uh, they don't have shields or anything, and they're pretty large targets. Size does factor into uh, arrow fire hitting you or whatnot. And one more important thing to talk about trample is your shield parry value. Like when you look at defense skill 13, you're including the shield parry at plus six. Trample ignores that completely. So this guy, although it looks like he has 13 defense skill, in face of trample would actually only have what seven and then so that's one of the reasons why i want the I, I would want the lighter infantry because they can they have a greater chance of avoiding the trample and when you avoid the trample you take one damage instead of i guess the 11 armor piercing you would take and also and this is kind of awkward point of agartha they have almost the same dps or damage as the bigger units like this guy swings much more accurately but he still only does 16 damage this guy swings for 15. <laughs> so they do almost the same amount of damage and really their job isn't even to like i wouldn't expect this person to kill grove guard this guy's job is to get run over by minotaurs and die very slowly so that this guy could kill him that's how i would theoretically fight against late age pan as late age gartha I haven't played the nation. I, I haven't played the matchup of the nations, so I could probably be, I could possibly be very wrong. And then losing a battle against the force this big means you just lose the game. <laughs> so I think TNC is now at an impasse of do they want to fight into my PD dumps? He knows I have a huge PD dump, PD dump here in the Gentle Plains, which means this army moving in could probably protect that. I could probably PD dump here in Resena. He can't reach the red mines. So I could probably do a PD jump here in Resena, and now he has to fight into either one of those, or turn around and defend himself in Hobartan against this Grove Guard. Alternatively, I'm noticing he, there's an, also an Utgard army attacking his other fort. So. <laughs> and his capital's gone. <laughs> so I think what ended up happening is TNG made such a big deal about this war against me here and just acting a fool on how, how possibly the scenario could happen where he attacks another player and the other player says, okay, we're at war then. And I think the rest of the lobby kind of saw that exchange happen and said, well, I guess if you're fighting Agartha, that means you're a really good war target for me. And now he's just under attack by other players. I think even Bogarus was a part of it, but I can't see it. So, in a fit of rage, it looks like the TNG player has actually demolished his capital. Some people, man, they can't just have fun with the game or play in a nice lobby. You just think everyone's out to get you. It's a shame, too, because I've always heard of this player, of the person behind this TNG, and I had always heard good things about them, that they're such a good player, and they're so wise, and they know all these mechanics about the game, and I was pretty excited to fight them, and it's honestly been a huge letdown that this is the experience I had with the player, and I very similar to player in some other uploads and games that I've had. I just wouldn't play with this person again because 
Like, I'm here for a fun war game. What the crap is this? <laughs> Anyways, with that, I think I'll end the episode here, and I'll see you guys next time on Turn 20.